I'm excited to share the word with you today. It's always a, a blessing and an opportunity to speak God's word. You know, it's it's a joy. Um, I know that God has prepared something, uh, something special for everyone. A message. All right. So let's start this by opening with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, afternoon that you gathered us corporately. Lord, Lord, I pray for you, the anointing of your word. I pray, God, that you would use me as I communicate the message to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I want to start by asking this simple question, right? You have to think this really quick. All right. So what is the most memorable, memorable gift you have received? What is the most memorable gift you have received? I'm not saying expensive, but uh, what is the most memorable, right? So think it through like for five seconds and then afterwards you can shout it. Okay, five, four, three, two. And then now I'm just gonna ask. So, sit in. All right, so one. Okay, what's the most memorable gift you have received? Can you shout it? My wife. Oh. My wife, okay. Well, Four points. Four points. Uh, let's go here. Uh, on this side, anybody? Cora? Huh? Uh, LB. Wow. LB? Wow. So sad. Alright. Social. Social gathering. Alright. Uh, go, the eyes up. Xbox 360. Xbox 360. Wow. And then, okay, so. Anybody want to share? Are you up yet to receive what you want? <laughs> That's why you're not commenting. Oh, uh, uh, Doc <laughs> Huh? Oh, wow. So, so nice. How about you, Pastor? What's your most memorable experience? <laughs> 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 oh, uh, so, Alexa wanted to, wanted to share. Come on. <laughs> life. Memorable. Life. Life. Yeah. Life. Life? Oh, you. Oh, wow. You're so deep. She got the main church. Wow. All right. So, uh, why, why, why did I ask this question? Uh, okay. So, uh, because somehow uh, the topic that we're gonna, or the lesson, the story that we're gonna discuss tonight, this talks about the one of the greatest gift that uh, somebody gave, right? So, so let's move on. And we are in our second week of our series called Generous Living, and our goal for this series is that we will have a generous lifestyle as a result of our encounter with Jesus. So, what is generous living? You may ask. Well, Pastor Robert uh, shared, defined it. Uh, last week, right? So let's go to our. We don't have a clicker, so our chart. Okay, generous living is an intentional way of living that reflects a life touched by God. Wow. Okay, so generous living is an intentional way of living that reflects a life touched by God. So what does that mean? So meaning, as Christ followers, we're not just to be generous in the aspect of giving. When you give your tithes, does that mean that I'm giving a generous lifestyle? No. All right, so not just through our mind. That's actually an obedience to God. That's when you give your time, right? So, so generous living is not just through our money, but in all aspects, right? What does that mean? Generous through our sharing our time with others, sharing our talents and giftings, being generous in everything. Like generous living is a lifestyle, right? So in the Bible, actually, there are many, there are many people whose lives were changed and transformed when they had an encounter with Jesus. And as a result, they lived a generous lifestyle. And in this three-week series, uh, Generous Living, we will look at three familiar stories that will serve as a mnemonic device for us to remember what generous living is. And if you can see, show the next slide. So, our uh, last one. Thank you, which one do I? <laughs> this is my first time. <laughs> Oh, no, no. Go back. Oh, there it is. First. Okay. All right. Three stories, right? The first first week, we, look, we looked at the woman who had an alabaster jar. Pastor uh, Robert. Oh, five loaves. Sorry, I was looking at Okay, sorry. Oh, five loaves and the fish, right? So, actually, 
uh, serving as a mnemonic device, right? So, when, remember the Joshua series? Yeah, yeah. All right, sorry. I'm not used to the clicker, so. All right, so. Our Joshua series is like a stone of remembrance. Uh, I remember that uh, when we had a book study talking about uh, the the stone of remembrance. So when you do, when we see these three stories, we would we would be reminded about generous living. Okay? So so last week Pastor Ron shared about the five loaves and two fish, and this week we will look at the woman who had an alabaster jar. And next week, Pastor Robert will end the series with the story of Zacchaeus and the sycamore tree. So, I, growing up, I didn't have a sycamore tree, but I remember there's a, for some reason, I just remember that uh, I would climb up our guava tree by a How many you have? No, guava tree. Uh, for some reason, I asked my wife, like, do, why, do, why do kids climb up trees? Do, I don't know the reason. Do you know? Because, because you can do it. So that's why. Okay. So anyway, so go on with the days. Yeah? So okay. So anyway, the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, uh, and Luke, Mark, Luke, and John accounts the story of a woman in the alabaster jar. And I was as I was studying on this topic, some theologians say that the woman in the story happened in two occasions. And in the Gospel of John, the woman was named. Okay. Just and for this Sunday, our story will focus on the Gospel of Matthew. And Mark. Okay, so with that said, let's start with our story and open our Bible and see what lesson we, we can learn from the woman with the alabaster jar. Alright, so it says here in Matthew 26, 1 to 2. Uh, there you go. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away. The Son of Man would be handed over to be crucified. So our story, just to give you a brief background, our story begins with Jesus talking to his disciples. And in chapter 24, it was mentioned that Jesus was with his disciples in Mount of Olives. So he was sharing about the signs of the end of the age, and he was using powerful stories about his return, who is Jesus, the Son of Man. So as we looked in verse 2, we see here that he mentioned that the Passover is two days away. And the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Imagine, he was with his disciples for the past three and a half years. And he was uh, telling his disciples, hey, in two days, I will be crucified. Can you imagine if uh, you're one of your best friends, if somebody, that somebody will tell you, hey, in two days, uh, this is the last two days of my life. How would you think, or how would you respond to that? Right? So, okay, so I wonder. Let's go into the story later. So while studying, I couldn't help but imagine the disciples' reaction when he mentioned that, that thing, that two, in two days, their master will be gone. Right? I saw it in Tagalog. So sorry. <laughs> What's the divine? Huh? Right? right? Yeah, right? No, okay, so <laughs> let's move on uh, to Matthew 26, the next verse. Right? Uh, Matthew 3. Uh, then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. Right? Schemed to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the festival, they said. Or they may be a riot among the people. So think, look at this for, uh, for verse 4 first. Go back. Right, there we go. Verse 4. All right, the chief priests and the elders of the people are now plotting a way how they can arrest Jesus and kill him. So, right, he was the, uh, the, the last six days he was teaching at the temple, that he, would, he was performing man, many miracles, and, and you know, the people were wanting to declare him as king. And that's why the, the, the religious leaders, the elders, were finding a, the best way. Not just to put him in jail, but to kill him. That's, I couldn't put my head into it. It's unimaginable. So the chief priests, right, they not just arrest and kill him. Because reading the text, it seems impossible to imagine. Can you imagine the teachers of the law could go to the extreme? They would go to the extreme to kill him. It says there in the verse, secretly and kill him. Well, have you heard about that? That he ever secretly killed someone, huh? 
<laughs> and they were planning that. Imagine, there were teachers, they would go up, they would teach the how to live a holy life, and yet there, there's something. I, I couldn't put my head into it. All right, so let's move into um, verse 6. Moving on to the next verse. All right, so this is a continuing story. After that, uh, while Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper. Right, so moving on to our next verse. Jesus was now in Bethany, you know, Simon the leper. Bethany was a village in Judea. Right, so about two miles of east of Jerusalem. So the name Bethany is translated by some to mean the house of faiths. Not faiths, not P-I-G-S. Faiths, like faiths. All right, so there are many uh, fig trees and palms in that area. Right, so, so uh, did they have figs? Uh, I, I remember, I, remember. I saw when we were, when we used to live in our Pasadena house, we, we had like five fig trees. And uh, it tastes good. <laughs> so I could imagine it's like, uh, a place full of fig trees. That's just good. So there is not much mention. Now let's move on. There's not much men, not much mention about Simon the, le the leper. Is uh, it's just that, uh, that he is one of the many people that Jesus healed during his ministry. Right. So moving on to verse seven. A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. Alabaster jar. So what's an alabaster jar? What's an alabaster? What's an alabaster? Now let's look. As I was uh, uh, researching, so it says here that it's a Greek word, alabaster, it's a Greek word translated as a flask jar or other translation means alabaster, which means perfume vase. Right? So actually alabaster was a stone commonly used found in Israel. So it was a, it was a hard stone. Uh, resembling white marble and it's referred to as one of the precious stones used in decoration of Solomon's temple so uh, it was referred in first Chronicles 29 to it's not on the screen but yeah so alabaster jars used to put ointment oil and perfume uh, so let's see in the book of Mark what happened next right so it says here while he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper so that was Jesus. A woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. So the woman went to Jesus, this alabaster jar, very expensive perfume, and then, you know, broke the jar and then poured the perfume on his head. Um, how do you use perfume if you have a very expensive perfume? You just spray it, right? My dad uses it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's like an air freshener master. <laughs> so, so I, I also see like somebody would just spray it. If it's expensive, I spray it in the air and then you go there, right? So, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's true. But I remember when I, in my high school days, when I, I don't have any perfume, I had Axe body spray. <laughs> Because in the afternoon we play basketball and then we're gonna come back and then to our class. So all of us are sweating. I mean, it's crazy. We do have axe perfume and then we just spray ourselves with it. So of course, uh, we feel foggy again. <laughs> so, but but anyway, so that's I, I can imagine like pouring the perfume on someone's head. Like, can you imagine that? The entire jar pouring that perfume on his head. While well, Jesus was reclining, he was reclining at the table, and then uh, he, the woman approached him and then poured it on his on his head. Can you imagine that? So, so I was like, wait, what? What did she do? Right? While well, I was studying, I was asking some questions. Why did she do this? Right? Can you think? You see that in the text. So, if this perfume was so expensive, why would she pour everything on Jesus' head? Maybe like use a cotton bud. And then put some, right? So different ways on how you can honor Jesus, but why pour everything, right? Or maybe a cotton bone, and then I'll put it under, like, put it your face, right? Different ways, but why? Why did the woman do this? Uh, so what happened next? Now let's see, right? So verse eight and nine. All right, let's look what happened. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. 
All right, I, I use that term most of the time, indignant. So, <laughs> why this waste? All right, this perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. All right, so we see here that the, upon seeing what the woman did, the disciples didn't like what the woman just did. In fact, just said they, they were indignant. So I, I'm going to be honest, I don't know what indignant means. So, <laughs> so I had to research. So indignant means, all right, in, in definition, it's a feeling or showing anger because of something unjust or unworthy. So you might have to it's like, what? What did you do? Like, it, it's, it's, so un, it's not fair. So the disciples were like, what? This is, how would you do something, you know, something like that? So, so direct, actually, uh, the reckless act of the woman resulted, it was reckless, right? I would say it's reckless. The reckless act of the woman resulted the disciples showing anger in front of their master, Jesus. It, I mean, their, their, their master is there and they, they couldn't help themselves but just just be indignant. Right? Did you, I, I mean, who among you have bosses in your workplace? Do you act the same when, you, uh, when your boss is not there or are you... I mean, maybe, but, but I can just imagine, like, you, sometimes you pretend, right, you're nice and all that, but, but, but of course you're nice, I'm not saying it's not, it's okay, but their master was there and they, their reaction was like, oh no, you did, there's something like that, right, so, but, so they have said, why this waste, right, so this perfume could have been sold at a high price, and the money given to the poor, if you could look at the verse, I go back again. Anyway, it's, it doesn't matter. It, it was mentioned earlier. So, how much does a perfume cost during their time? I mean, um, let's go in the book of Mark again. Now, let's fast forward. Go in the book of Mark. So, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, "Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's what? Read it there. More than a year's what? Wages. Yeah, wages and the money uh, given to the poor, right? And then you rebuked her harshly." Wow, the disciples, being disciples for three and a half years. It's like they rebuked her harshly. It's like, so in, there's injustice here. We, we need to defend Jesus. Because Jesus, I was thinking like, Jesus was just, well, let's still have oil on his body. He's like soaking in oil. <laughs> what did you do to our master? <laughs> Not master, <laughs> master. <laughs> all right, so, all right, so, in the book, Mark says the cost of the perfume of the jar is more than a year's wages, right? So, Pastor Robert's message last week regarding the feeding of the 5,000, remember that? Of course, it's just last week, you should know, right? So, it was... <laughs> so, if you didn't watch, you can watch in our YouTube channel. <laughs> just plug in the... And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Alright, so... So, going back, it was said that the cost to feed everyone is at least half a year's wages, right? So, that means the cost of the alabaster jar is twice or even more than the amount. That's a lot of five loaves. <laughs> that's a gigantic loaf right there. The big fish, maybe you could feed the whale, like, yo, oh, this is so, it's so it's like, And so, we could imagine now why the disciples were indignant. Because that's a lot. More than a year's wages. Okay, imagine. Think with me for a moment, right? Uh, you work 12 months in a year. You don't spend it. Don't spend the money, that your salary. Just put it in a bank. And then, uh, God told you or asked you to give it to, to God. This is net. I'm not saying you, you worked hard, you saved it, you didn't do it. Would you do it? Actually, side that, side that. I saw in the news that there was like a, a truck uh, that was in the five oh, San Diego yeah, 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 yeah. that attached, like an uh, armored truck that opened and then the people were like, oh, they were getting it. So like, I, why am I saying this? I don't know. So okay, I'll go back. <laughs> just a lot of money. I'm just, no, maybe I'm saying, I was saying it like, oh, that's a lot. That would cost like more than a year's wages. Okay, that's maybe when I was reading the news, the news and I was like, oh, yeah, maybe. That's a lot. It's unimaginable. So. So in the perspective, now let's do, and so we could imagine now uh, the disciples were indignant, right? So in the perspective of the disciples, the woman's act was reckless because of the value of the perfume that was in the jar. So you know what, while I was studying, one of the things that I noticed is the woman's boldness to approach Jesus and to do that. 
because during the historical periods uh, covered by the Bible, you know, most societies were patriarchal, right? Meaning men hold exclusive power in all aspects, in life, religion, government, and family. So in her story, the woman went into great lengths to approach Jesus. But of course, now in our time, when you look at now, in our time is different. In our society, men and women have equal rights, right? So that's a side note. So I just noticed on this text, the woman did a response. She was just, she just, in her heart, she, she did it out of uh, her love for her master, right? So she was silent. It's just, this is just me, right? So I just noticed in the text that, that the woman didn't respond. Um, she was silent. I could imagine now, if it's our time, you know, the woman would fight back. It's like if the disciples rebuke her, she's like, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> Maybe uh, she would say, like, I'm doing this for Jesus, and you would rebuke me. I was like, oh, there's fight. Fight away in the dark. <laughs> Something like that, right? So, anyway, let's move on to our story. Now, if you would look here, this is the boat in both Matthew and Mark. The passage here is similar. I mean, look, it's almost similar to and how Matthew and Mark had written it. And so, aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And Mark, leave her alone. Why are you bothering, said Jesus, uh, why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. She has done a beautiful thing to me. So, so moving on to her story, what happened next? Jesus rebuked the disciples saying, leave her alone. Why are you bothering this woman? And both Matthew and Mark's recording was almost similar, right? So on verse 11, I move on to verse 11. Giving to the poor, they said, The poor you always have with you, but you will not always have me. In Mark, it says, The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. Okay. Remember, I just mentioned like you know, seven minutes ago that Jesus, in two days' time, your best friends, I mean, your masters, are going to be killed. Jesus just told, told, told this disciple. Maybe, I you know, uh, probably a couple of, uh, it, it didn't took long, but he, they, I don't know, maybe they forgot, right? So, uh, that their master is about to be crucified. So, so in verse 11, giving to the poor seems to be a good reason for the disciples to be indignant. But in this text, Jesus said to them, you will not always have me. It seems that Jesus was reminding them again, like what he mentioned in the text, that in two days he will be crucified. Now, let's look again uh, in verse 11. Jesus tells his disciples that the act of the woman is an act to prepare him for burial. The poor you will always have with you. Hold on. Yeah. So in Mark 14, 7, it says there, the poor you will always have with you. Can you click uh, Charlton? Next slide. Okay, okay. There it, okay. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. There you go. So Jesus tells his disciples that the woman is to prepare him for his burial. As I was studying this, I asked, what's the significance of pouring oil for burial? And so what's the significance? So actually, in the Old Testament, it was mentioned in Leviticus 8, 10 to 12, that Moses and Aaron, they were considered high priests, so used to oil to consecrate themselves, um, tabernacle and the altar. And they used oil to set apart to be holy. After that act, they are considered holy unto God. And the sin offering, a bull or a lamb, or a lamb animal that will be killed is offered unto God. Now, this is just me, right? So, but the woman's act of pouring oil on Jesus she didn't know that her act was somehow maybe a prophetic act uh, that Jesus is being set apart, considered holy, and will be killed. Will be killed to serve as an offering lamb for all of our sin. Imagine that. And I would assume that the woman only did that act because of his love for Jesus, right? So let's let's move on. This is the final verse. It says here, truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So the woman's act was commended by Jesus. And what greatest praise 
the greatest praise from Jesus to be recognized, right? To be recognized by God. Okay, so now, if there's one thing we can learn from this story is that anything we do for Jesus is not a waste. You can click now, uh, chart. Anything we do for Jesus is not a waste, but something beautiful. So it says there in Matthew 26, 8 to 9, why this waste? Right? So I said that, oh, and also in Matthew 26, 10, she has done a beautiful thing to me. So inside Simon the leper's house, we see that there, that the, we see that the characters that were present were there, that were there with Jesus, the woman, the disciples, and most likely Simon the leper, because it was his house and maybe others. They were all witnesses to what happened. They, they have all have different perspectives. The act of the woman is an act of worship and devotion to Jesus, but the disciples' per perspective was the act was just a waste. Jesus saw the woman's act and considered her act as something beautiful. This Jesus we are talking about is God, who came from heaven, and even Jesus knows what beautiful is, and even the angels worship Him, right? So yet, He saw this act, the act of the woman, as something beautiful. So let me ask you now, how about us? What's, your per what's our perspective when you do things for God? What's the cause? So let's look at uh, some perspectives, right? And God's perspective as we click on the table. And how we spend our time, money, and resources, talents, and giftings. So now, uh, as we look at the time, some in people's view, uh, some say that the that when we spend time with God, praying, reading the Word, attending, and serving on a Sunday, the world will say, it's a waste. Why waste time? I mean, why go to church when you can just stay home? You know, it's been a long week, and you deserve to rest. The world will, the world tells, the, the, in people's view, it will tell you that you're not going to miss anything by going to church. So, missing, it won't hurt. We try to justify our actions. Now, another example is, I don't have the time. I'm tired. And to say, I've been working six days straight, right? But you see, people say, oh, I'm tired. I don't have the time. But you see them on social media, <laughs> going outside, doing other stuff. But when we want to do things for Jesus, they're not there, right? So we all go through our daily life. We face trials and challenges. We find ways to relax to distress and for me that's uh, basketball playing basketball seeing my friends playing uh, as i play basketball with them that's a joy for me it's it's my passion and i love seeing them uh, playing with them so but if i do think all these things and do not have god then there's something missing right i get refreshed every time i spend time with god i get encouraged when i worship god and my personal time and corporately in church and hear the word of god so is it a waste it's not. So now, in God's view, what is God's perspective? It's considered beautiful, right? Say beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So when you spend your time with God, there's a sense of joy, accomplishment, and knowing that you fulfilled your purpose. Although at times, of course, it may may, may be tiring uh, for some or most people who are serving, right? So, the, but the joy is there, right? The sense of accomplishment, the sense of a fulfillment is there. Again, as we look into this, the one point, anything we do for Jesus is not a waste, but something beautiful, right? So now let's look at the money, resources, and people's view. Uh, why would I waste my money giving to God? I worked hard for this. I deserve to use and spend it the way I want to. So, and also some maybe other examples. Uh, I don't have enough. Kid, sorry, I get you, but I do not have enough, right? I go from paycheck to paycheck. I have, I have to help other people, right? So why would I give to God? So now let's go in God's view. It's in man of God. It's considered beautiful, right? So God owns everything. In this perspective, God owns everything. I am just a steward of what He has entrusted me. And again, anything we do for Jesus is not a waste, but something beautiful. Now, what about talents and giftings? People's view is considered it as waste. 
I, it's considered as waste. And why would I share my talents and giftings when I'm getting paid a lot per hour <laughs> to use it for my profession? And I don't have any time. Or you could say, I don't have any talents of giftings. Maybe, maybe Hannah, maybe Charlton, maybe Arlene, maybe, maybe these people, but not me. I don't have anything to give, right? So I don't have anything to offer. So maybe it could be a waste, right? So, but in God's view, it's beautiful. God has given me the talents. When you look at it, God has given me the talents and skills. Why did uh, God give this to me? To use it for His glory. And I will use it for God's purpose in my life. Sometimes the people, actually, here's the thing, right? Sometimes, although they're sincere, the people who are close to you, though their intentions may be good, they're the ones who are discouraging you to fulfill God's purpose in your life. Right. Again, anything we do for Jesus is not a waste, but something beautiful. Okay, so, you know what? God has given us free will. A choice to decide how we want to start, how we want to use what God has given us. Every day, we have to make that decision in our head and in our heart. Should I follow the people's view or God's view? Let's look at Matthew 26, 13. It says here, Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So going back to the story in verse 15, when Jesus mentioned in this verse that she, what she has done will be told in memory of her, the statement of Jesus has been fulfilled. Indeed. Why? Because we're fast forward 2,000 years after, we're discussing it now. Right? Isn't that amazing? So... We're still talking about it. God is looking for people whom He can use to fulfill His will and purpose on earth. There's a reason why we have what we have, and we can use it for the advancement of God's kingdom. Now, wouldn't it be great that you can live a lasting legacy to the next generation when your kids look back and they will say, uh, I have a relationship with God because somebody invested their time with me. So again, as I am, anything we do for Jesus is not a waste, but something beautiful. All right, so that's the, uh, what we can learn from this uh, story. And now I'm going to join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord, for uh, uh, this encouragement, God. Thank you for speaking to us, God, that uh, when we do things for you, uh, it's not considered waste, but it's actually considered beautiful. As I pray, church, I want to recognize, I want to pray for two groups of people. Uh, if you've been faithful to God in giving your best, giving your time, money, and resources and talents to Him. And you've been serving Him as a family. Would you lift up your hand and let me pray for you. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are here who have been faithfully serving. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, God. Lord, I pray that you will give them joy as they continue to serve you, God. I know that they are complete, God, in you. And what a joy it is, God. So I pray, God, for their prayer, that their prayers, Lord. I pray that you will be, uh, as they're hoping and praying for something, Lord, I pray, God, that they will... Uh, that they will have joy as they wait, Lord, for that promise, Lord. Lord, I also pray, God, for continued joy for these people, for my brothers and sisters that are here. Put down your hands. And as you're hearing the message earlier, God is speaking to you. And that God is asking you to give your best to Him. You may not have been faithful in giving what's best to Him. So I want to challenge you. Ask for forgiveness. You don't have to raise your hands. Just, just 
pray. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness, God. I've been reminding them to, to give. Then they disobey, God. So, Lord, forgive us. Put that trust in you. Help us to take that step of faith, God. Lord, putting you, help us to put your faith, put you first, Lord, and trust in you to give our time, money, and resources. We're going to give everything to you. Lord, you have given all these blessings to us, not just for us to enjoy, but the advancement of your kingdom. So, Lord, increase our faith in you, God. And from now on, we want to live a lifestyle of generosity, Lord, just like the woman who offered her best to you. Thank you, Jesus, our beautiful Jesus, our beautiful Lord. Thank you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.